I'm looking forward to what we come up with on this and is the virtual hot seat that we've had somebody send in some, uh, basically a challenge, a dilemma that they're going through. And what we will do is we will sort of mastermind, brainstorm some potential solutions. We won't know the whole context, some of it. So we may have to make some assumptions, but the aim is that we can actually help this person out and maybe somebody else out there that is going through something similar. It's a real world business challenge that's happening right now. So today's challenge is one of my goals this year is to add a new revenue stream to my business. What is the best way to structure a new service offer and how can I work out the best way to price it? Should I go high ticket? Like I see so many out there suggesting, I don't necessarily feel comfortable with this since so many are struggling or just scraping by right now. And I don't want to appear unsympathetic. So first thoughts on that. This person is a funeral director. (laughs) (laughs) Well, you know, (laughs) My God, I'm going to say something really sort of unsensitive. But if you are a funeral director at at this period of time, you probably don't need to hire prices because you've got volume. Sad. Uh, My dad is a priest in the Church of England. Uh, Not anymore. My dad was a priest in the Church of England. And uh, he, when he retired, uh, which is now, he became a freelance funeral celebrant. Um, Mm. Because most people don't have... uh, a priest when they you know most people don't go to church uh and so they don't have a local parish priest and so when when a relative passes away the funeral director will always ask who is your priest they'll say we don't have one so there's a pool of freelancers available Hmm. and uh dad you know never went to marketing school went to theological college and every time we went on holiday for you know 10 15 years he would always send a postcard to the funeral director and that is put yourself solid networking and referral strategies all wrapped up in one. That is keeping your existing valuable relationships very close. So that's the brief funeral uh, director story aside. What do you think about this? Uh, What do you think about this story? Adam, what's your your take on this? Want to add a new revenue stream to my business? What do I do? So this to me is saying that this is is a person who has probably got, and we've got to make some assumptions, but they've probably got more of a traditional offline, uh, offline, service business, and it's been hit by the situation. So maybe they've done some research into creating programs or online stuff and all the rest of it. And maybe they've watched a few people talking about high ticket programs. And they're just looking at ways to maybe be able to deliver a service in maybe a bit more of a leveraged way, or maybe they are looking at a way to diversify the revenue because their core revenue stream has been hit by by the situation of the pandemic. Maybe there's a bit of a psychology piece here that's going through it in that the the question of I don't want to appear unsympathetic and raise prices also tells me that there is probably a client or an existing client base that has been hit. So maybe it's more of a question of going back to the foundations before you even consider what the service is, how you price it. Go back to your foundation and ask that question, who is this for? Is it for my existing client base? Is it for... Um, you know, what, what result do they want? What is the problem they have and how am I going to solve it before you even consider the pricing options behind, you know, or the structure of a new service, anything like that. And often it will come down to that. So, I mean, that's, that's where I would start. I mean, if, would you have anything to add around that in terms yeah, of, it's such, of it's such a broad question, Adam, and, and not, you know, it's not, there's little context. There's no context. We don't know yeah. whether this person runs a travel agency or, or whether they are a, a personal trainer or whether they do accountancy or whether they run a, an affiliate marketing program. Or we, mm. we, we just absolutely no context, but it does allow us to talk in broader brushstrokes mm. about what, when, and how should you add additional revenue streams to your business? And as you said, Adam, 100% correctly, it always, always, always begins with the person to whom you're selling. Who Mm. is your target market? And then what can we, what do they want? What do they need? And how can we provide them with what they want and they need? And how can we charge accordingly in such a way that it represents great value for them? Because any sales Mm. transaction represents a valuable uh, transfer of property in both directions. The salesperson values your cash more than they value the resources required to deliver the service. Uh, otherwise, they wouldn't be charging what they do. Uh, and the person who is happily handing over the money to receive the service values the service more than they value the cash. So we should, you know, any transaction that takes place that is not forced, that is not based upon monopoly uh, or 
undue, un, unforeseen circumstances like insurance payments or, or emergency bills or something like that is always based upon both people being happy or well, the transaction just wouldn't take place. So there's two concepts I want to discuss. The first one is the $1,000 burger. The $1,000 burger is, um, well, well, let me ask you a question, What, uh, which I will always also answer because it's a rhetorical question. What kind of restaurant sells a $1,000 burger? The answer is the restaurant that sells a $1,000 burger is the restaurant that has a $1,000 burger on the menu. If you don't have a thousand dollar burger on the menu, nobody's ever going to knock on the door and say, "Hey, I, I like the like the look of your two hundred dollar lobster. Could I please have a one thousand dollar burger?" But if you put it in the menu, there is a chance that you will sell it. Now, you don't necessarily want to sell it, right? Mm -hmm. Because if you're always selling one thousand dollar burgers, you haven't tested the top of the market. You don't know what your market want to spend their money on if they're regularly buying thousand dollar burgers maybe you need a $2,000 hot dog, right? Mm. So if you've got something that tests the very top of the market, that's my approach to high ticket items. You know, don't yeah. bring your assumptions to the table. What's high ticket for yeah. you might not be high ticket for somebody else. You know, have you so, ever paid $120 for a shave? I have, you know, um, because there's a place that sold $120 shaves. It would take me about person. three weeks to grow it back after that. So I, the, <laughs> it would be I'm money the, well spent. <laughs> right? I'm the kind of person who likes to sit in the front of an airplane, right? Yeah. For one person, that's utter madness. And for another person, it's um, kind of fundamentally, yeah, of course, I'm going to sit in the front of the airplane. So mm. don't bring your assumptions or presumptions if you don't have experience, right? I see lots of people say, I don't know if I can do high ticket. Well, they've never actually sold high ticket. For them, high ticket is, uh, mm. you know, a $5,000 consultation. Whereas for, for the next person in the line, high ticket is $750,000 consultation. So don't, you know, don't, don't bring your concept. If you truly, truly, truly know the market, you mm. will price accordingly. If you don't truly know the market, you won't. That's do you think, um, sort of uh, building on that, do you think that there's a, a, and maybe this is where this question has come from, there's a bit of a prevalence and maybe that's why I say that I think that this person's probably been searching around for a few ideas and all the rest of it. They probably, you know, downloaded a few uh, freebies and gone on a couple of webinars and all the rest of it. And, and they're a bit, like some people are telling you, you have to go down this high ticket route. You Or maybe they're thinking, well, you have to go down the, right, if you're going to build an online sales funnel and then create a product at the end of it and all the rest of it, you have to start low ticket and tripwire and all that kind of thing, which is, you know, <laughs> baffling that you would consider that without actually testing a, a, an offer anyway. But a lot of people are hung up on that high ticket and the cost and the price but they're not actually then going back and asking themselves, what is the value in solving the problem that you're offering to solve for somebody out there? Because yeah, they don't have confidence in it. And, and that, I mean, your, your assumption is my assumption as well, that this person is operating in the online marketing space where the concept of high ticket has been sold as a, a uh, quite rightly, Sorry. within the very small, very mm. incestuous, uh, slightly distasteful online marketing space as being a, a godsend and a be-all and end-all. Yeah. But like a panacea that just will you know, answer all your When has prayers. high ticket been there? I tell you when, high ticket is a... Is a uh, high ticket. Let me rephrase that. If you're going shopping, no, if you're going fishing, let's come back to our fishing lounge from the very beginning. If you've got the resources available to you, then cheap and cheerful is a fantastic business model. It always has been. We are the cheapest service provider. Nobody beats us on prices. That is a brilliant way to grow a business. Um, as long as you can maintain the margins and as long as you have the resources available. What resources do you need? Inventory, insurance, relationships with suppliers, uh, ability to get people through the door of your supermarket, right? This person, probably not in that situation based upon the language that they use. Probably. One person, intellectual property, good idea. What, what is my good idea? What do I do with it? Right. So in that instance, forgetting the term high ticket, mm -hmm. looking to support dozens or hundreds of budget buyers is a bad idea. Because you, and this is why I always cringe when I see people who are new to the consulting, coaching or training space say, I'm going to start $47,000, uh, sorry, $47 a month mastermind program or a $27 a month mastermind program because my friend or my teacher or I did a course by somebody who's got 400,000 people on their mailing list and 40,000 people in their $47 a month program. I'm like, yeah. And they've only been working for two decades to, to build up to that point. Mm. 
What yeah. resources do you have available to you? R is supporting 100. Can you even find 100 people who will give you their email address, let alone $47? I'm not suggesting you don't. I'm just saying, if you're just getting started, also, I don't think this person is just getting started because of the language they use, because they said mm. an additional revenue stream. Mm. But if you are just getting started, you are looking for the fastest route to the money because the money is the resource that will support everything. You're, got, you're looking to sign up 20 clients by any means necessary to fund your uh, market research, to fund your growth, and to put that all-important big fish on the family table. So you should be looking for 100%. big fish when you're just getting started. No question. Does that mean more, forgetting the high ticket question, is that, are you looking for budget buyers? Are you looking for non-budget buyers? I say you're looking for non-budget buyers, high margins, um, yeah. perpetually people will stick around for a while. And now, the things that, but before I sort of like let you let's sort of continue, one of the, I'll be honest, one of the, um, one of the reasons I selected this specifically for you was because I actually saw something in this that it's, it's something that not, again, not a lot of people are going to consider as an option, but this person is asking about additional revenue stream, which makes me think that they're trying to come up with an idea or, or something brand new. Well, why not consider the kind of model? And I'm not sort of saying you go and talk to Matthew necessarily because I don't know your industry, but there is an option there. If you're looking for an additional revenue stream, why don't you look for that proven model out there that's already existing and you license the IP to do that? If appropriate, that's very good. Often when I hear additional revenue stream though, Adam, it's because people have given up. I've got a course and 100 people have taken it. Now I need an additional revenue stream. Well, if a hundred people have taken it, I'm guessing there's another thousand people that would take it if you took it to them. Mm. Why are we stopping now? Why are we giving up? There's two ways basically to grow a business, only two. One is you take your existing product or service to a new group of people, whether directly by opening a new outlet or opening up a new target market or indirectly through licensing, franchising, stuff like that. The other option is to add additional services and products to your existing target market. Starbucks started with coffee, uh, dry coffee, ended up adding water, and then you could have liquid coffee, ended up adding bananas, newspapers, smoothies, all that crap. But they had an existing market. So whatever you're, whatever you're thinking about taking out, it comes back to what Adam said at the very beginning. Whatever you're thinking of adding on, comes back mm -hmm. to what Adam said at the very beginning. Look at the people who you serve and ask, do they need a newspaper with their coffee? Do they want fries with that? And if you're ready to, um, if, you, if you've got your existing revenue source and it's still extant despite COVID and it's still going along, go and find another 50, 100, 300,000 people who are interested mm. in that product. Or conversely, go back and talk to those people and find out what other problems that they're dealing with and see if you can solve them. Come up with that product, that service that could actually solve the next phase or Another way is, is, is if you can't and it's not your, your, your wheelhouse, partner with someone that can. Absolutely. Some other people, the power in, in, in relationships is absolutely everything for me. You know, one of our members of the Boot Yourself Solar Advisory Board, one of our certified coaches, Amy Landino. Amy Landino has close to 500,000 um, uh, YouTube subscribers today. And we were having a conversation on our advisory board and somebody said, well, I'd like that. How'd you get that? And she said, well, you know, it was only showing up four times a week for 10 years to get my mm. first 100,000 people. Um, and, you know, I, I no disrespect or, or assumption to the person who submitted this question, but are you showing up enough for mm. your existing source of revenue? 100%. Because, yeah, there's, there's, that's often with, you know, if you can then go and find someone like that, if you had some, I don't know, form of uh, offer to make to someone like that with 500,000 followers, this is a bad example maybe, but... If you could then go and say, well, I don't need an additional revenue stream. Maybe I can just use my offer and offer it to somebody else's audience. There you go. There's your stream. Or that's, that's bringing in new clients in a different way. Like so many find different another, ways. Find another group of people who will buy your yeah. existing thing. Yeah. Get invited to fish in, in, a, in a pond of, or private pond full of hungry fish where there's no other fishermen fishing whatsoever. So on that fishing uh, analogy, Matthew, thank you. That was um, thank you for having me. The fun. pleasure was entirely mine, Adam. I'll come back anytime you like.